This morning around 4.45, I was driving my 16-year-old son to the airport. He's going on his first flight by himself. And as we were driving down, I noticed something really weird in the sky. It was dark. And there was this thin disk of bright, deep yellow peeking through the clouds. And I said to him, what the heck is that thing in the sky? There's been a lot of like weird UFO stuff coming out lately. And I thought <laughs> maybe this was my chance. I'd finally gotten a glimpse at these alleged aliens. But no, no, alas, it was no spaceship. It was this piece of the magnificently nearly full Aquarius supermoon it was just peeking through the black clouds of the morning and eventually as the sun was coming up the moon was setting it showed its full self and it was just spectacular the full moon is always a time of reflection and Aquarius is such an independent strong archetype it's in this unique dichotomy of being this maverick, right, of individuality, but it's also the push of humanitarian collective progress. And then with this being a full moon, we have to think about where's the sun? It's the one shining the light, and that's in the Leo archetype. And the Leo archetype is the place where we need to push ourselves and be creative and courageous, otherwise known as courageous. But if there is a kryptonite for the Leo Aquarius axis, it's the fear of judgment. That can be the thing that stops all your progressive individuality and self-expressive output. Those are two things that are part of what makes our human life, our human experience really beautiful. But being judged by others is a real fear many of us have because it's tribal in its roots. It goes way, way back. When we think about tribal acceptance, that could be a matter of life or death, right? This is the difference between having resources, shelter, love, reproductive opportunities, or having nothing and probably being dinner for the lions. Like, it's a big deal. We're still functioning on that level of deep tribal acceptance desire. And guess who else knows that? The major social media platforms. That's what's fueling it. The hearts, the likes, the views, the comments, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So social media is entangling us and manipulating us all the way down deep into our tribal root needs. It's, it's really interesting. But now... You know, it's not like a matter of life or death, whether somebody likes us or accepts us. And even more critically, we've got to think about the amount of people we're considering as their opinions being valuable, part of our tribe, because that's expanded exponentially beyond what we've evolved to experience. There's this thing called Dunbar's number. Dunbar's number is a suggested cognitive limit of people we can maintain stable relationships with socially where we will know who they are, we know who each person is, and how each person relates to every other person. In the 1990s, British anthropologist Robin Dunbar found a correlation between the primate brain size and their average social group size. So using the average human brain size and extrapolating the results from primates, he proposed that humans can comfortably maintain approximately 150 stable relationships. There are some arguments to that number. Uh, a guy named Philip Lieberman said that nutritional limitations led to societies of approximately 30 to 50 people. We have big human brains, consume a lot of nutrients, more than eight brains. So making a group size of 150 without, you know, rudimentary agriculture was a little big for Paleolithic times. You know, maybe evolved into 150 when agriculture came in, but things are changing again, right? We keep evolving, evolving. But initially, a potential amount of people we were designed to interact with and care about their opinions could be an even smaller number, right? 30 to 50. We're dealing with a social parameter that's kind of coded. And when we put that into the context of social media, we're interacting with a lot more than 150 people a day. It could be several hundred people, potentially thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions of people who suddenly have some sort of access to you. Now, to me, that's crazy. I don't know. What do you think? To me, it's, it's wild thinking about that. But here's where the Aquarian Leonine story is taking us. The collective and the individual. Self-expression, group expression. They are all intertwined. The Leo concept, the Leo archetype, gets a lot of credit for that personal expression point. But that personal expression has to be shared out into the world in order to inspire the collective. And the Aquarian other half, the other side of the coin, is about individuality. But that individuality needs to be shared out into the world to further the collective. 
let's just be honest, being criticized is challenging because it shakes our foundation, the foundation of our reality structures. This is even harder when it's directed at your expression, your art, your creations, your body, your choices, your politics, your opinions, your sports team, whatever. Generally, anything that you're passionate about or that you use as part of your identity. So you know what I mean. It sucks to get criticized. I don't think anybody's lining up for that experience. When it does happen, it's very easy to give in to one of two reactions. First is fighting back, being defensive, argumentation. And the second is giving in to self-doubt, giving up your position to please others. So neither of these two choices is the right move in reacting to criticism. Philosopher Albert Hubbard says, to escape criticism, do nothing. Let that sit with you for a second. The only way that you can ensure that nobody's going to criticize you in your life is to do absolutely nothing. And what kind of life is that? Is that the life that you want? Well, let me tell you, especially the people pleasers out there and the recovering people pleasers like myself, um, I feel like I'm in recovery, that you cannot please all the people all the time. You can't even please most of the people most of the time. On every single one of these videos that I make, I get dislikes. Every single one. No matter how much effort I put into the video, inevitably more than one person, multiple people, have to go out of their way <laughs> to tell me that it sucks. <laughs> and that's hard to get used to, especially at first it was hard to get used to. Now I think it's a little bit funny, but there may be five dislikes and only I see them. And there could be like 500 likes, but those five dislikes are like, what, what did I do wrong? And that's dealing with, you know, something ridiculous because they're not even known people. They're not even known values. I don't know who they are. The deal with social media in general is that your results are quantifiable. They're not something you have to guess about. <laughs> you can see the numbers. If what you're doing is appreciated by the masses, which is just a collective of mostly strangers. So the conclusion I've come to here on this concept of criticism is that being criticized is important. It's good. It's good for personal growth. And that might sound counterintuitive, but it's not the criticism that holds the power. It's how you react to it, how you internalize it or choose not to internalize it. So I have two teenage boys and they're both really into working out, lifting weights, the gym, all that stuff. My younger son has a huge Arnold Schwarzenegger flag in his room and he had his birthday a few days ago. Part of his party, part of his present was to go to a powerlifting gym with his friends. I'm telling you, man, everybody in that gym was insanely in shape. I mean, like, whoa, they all looked like stand-ins for the next Marvel movie superheroes, men, women, all of them, wow, amazing. One of the things the boys are really proud of is their weightlifting calluses. They show each other their calluses. And each day they're pushing themselves to the limit, lifting these weights, the skin on their hands are getting thicker and thicker. Each criticism can be seen as a set in the powerlifting gym. It's a thickening of your skin. It's a building of strength in the muscles of your self-expression. It's an understanding that you can't please everyone ever, so why compromise your individuality? That being said, the most beautiful power here that we have is extending that grace and acceptance to other people who are expressing their individuality. That's where it gets hard, right? We want to be able to express ourselves and be individuals, but we also need to let other people be free to do the same thing. We don't have to agree. We don't have to like what other people do or think or say, but if we're claiming our own sovereignty, we have to allow other people to have their own sovereignty without judgment. This is where we get a picture of reality that's much bigger. Opposing opinions can coexist. Both have space to be equally true and equally false at the same time. That's cognitive dissonance, right? If that makes you uncomfortable, that's what it is. It's holding two things to be equally true and equally false at the same time in your mind. And it's hard, it's really hard, but that's reality. Recently, I was watching this clip of a discussion with a mainstream journalist interviewing Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is this potential presidential candidate in the 2024 election, which is going to get wild and weird, I'm telling you. But <laughs> this is interesting because I feel like this is a whole new perspective. I'll play the clip for you. This week, former President Trump said about you, Kennedy is smart and he's a common sense guy. What kind of man do you think Donald Trump is? Well, you know, here's what I'm not going to do in this race. I'm not going to attack other people per personally. I don't think it's good for our country. 
And I think, you know, what I'm trying to do in this race is bring people together, is to try to bridge the divide between Americans. And so I'm proud that President Trump likes me, even though I don't agree with him on most of his issues. I'm, because I don't want to alienate people. I want to bring people together. I'm not a politically interested person. I'm, I'm really not telling anybody else what to do politically here. I'm just pointing out that there was a really interesting part of his expression, because at least in this one statement, we're seeing that there could be a change in the direction away from separationist tactics. We don't need to agree with people to respect them and allow them to have their own opinions. We don't need to attack people personally and add to the madness. When someone criticizes us, it's most likely based on their own biases, their own opinions, their own reality, their own thoughts, their own little universe. We're a bunch of universes just bumping into each other. It doesn't mean it's true for you unless you accept that it, it's true. Once the sting of that initial criticism dims, you know, look a little closer at the criticism and you can decide for yourself if it was constructive, if it was a statement that can help you grow and change and be better, or if it was just a meaningless attempt at control, you know, wanting to control reality of their own reality and maybe uh, controlling you. Being human and doing anything, anything in your life, it's going to lead to some criticism at some point and that has to be okay because what are the alternatives? Doing nothing? It's the calluses, it's the inner strength, it's the muscles of self-embodiment. It's that Aquarius Leo power, personal power principle, leading us to a collective acceptance and a change for the better. That's just something to contemplate. I wish you a beautiful Aquarian full moon, and I will talk to you next time.